Hello, this is Tom Sargent. Um, I want to welcome you to the boot camp. And my job, my privilege, is to tell you why I like Python and Julia, which I first got exposed to um, by members of a previous boot camp. Um, basic reason I like Python is that it's very complementary to economics and the way that I think good economic models are structured, constructed, taken to the data, evaluated, and improved. So I use the term model. Um, so let me explain what I mean by that. Um, so, The key object that we're going to be interested in is a sequence. Um, uh, I'm going to let yt be a vector, and I'm going to think um, that there's some sequence, uh, potentially infinite, of outcomes. <clears throat> so these are the outcomes um, which are the subject of our of our model. Um, so there's going to be two versions of this YT. There's going to be theoretical or I'll call them population versions. And then there's going to be data, which we're going to regard as sample versions. So there's going to be a sequence, a vector sequence. Um, of course, when we have data, we'll only observe a, um, a sample going from zero to say cap T. Okay. I want to regard um, this YT as uh, random. I regard that population as random. Um, in particular, um, there's going to be some probability distribution over it. And I'm going to write this joint probability distribution as F. Um, let me let me define let me define this vector as uh, just this. I'll just define that as a, a vector. So it's going to be it's going to be a sequence of vectors. Um, so it's going to be a joint distribution over all of y, and it's going to be parameterized by some parameters. So these are going to be parameters. I'll tell you about them in a minute. And these are outcomes. And again, by this I mean a joint density, a joint probability density over an entire sequence. indexed by some parameters. Um, and when I say a model, this is what I mean by a model. So a model is a probability distribution over a sequence, indexed by some parameters. And those are the objects I'm, I'm thinking of. Okay, so what are these parameters? Um, so in an economic model, the parameters and um, the parameters are going to be things that characterize objects that an economist um, reasons in terms of. So these would be some examples. Some parameters will determine the preferences of the agents inside the model. Another would be some parameters would characterize technologies that the agents inside the model are operating. Another would be information flows. And then probably not a parameter, but perhaps supplementing these would be an equilibrium concept. 
So if we take the parameters, the, 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 so there's going to be parameters describing preferences, technology, information flows. Um, you know, there might be also in some kinds of models like Rick Evans works with, there might be some parameters about demographics. There might be some parameters that describe government policies. Um, so then when we couple these with an equilibrium concept, um, and we do some computations, we're going to compute the outcome is going to be a joint density over the outcomes indexed by the parameters. So for every set of parameters, there's a different joint density. And um, so notice that we're talking about key objects. Um, I'm using the term objects in the sense of an economist. I'll use it in the sense of a Python programmer a little bit later. The key objects are going to be, well, they're going to be parameters describing preferences, technologies, information flows, and so on. There's going to be outcomes. And what for an economist would be um, outcomes? Well, they would be prices, quantities, um, that's basically everything. Uh, th these would be include prices, these interest rates would be included here. Labor supplies would be included there. Incomes would be implied. So those are what my outcomes are. This is my theta, and this is my yt. And we're thinking in terms of a dynamic model, meaning t is indexing time. Actually, the same formalism might deal with a cross-section model in which t indexes uh, space or people. Okay, now equilibrium concept. Something equilibrium concept, there's going to be basically, there's two ruling equilibrium concepts that are closely related. One is a competitive equilibrium. Um, the other is a Nash equilibrium and its variance, version variance, uh, sub game. A perfect uh, can be viewed as a special case of Nash. Um, okay, so we're going to have equilibrium concepts. We have preferences, technology, information flows, demographics, government policies, and they're going to produce. Um, be, they're going to be parameterized by theta, and then they're going to produce outcomes. That's a general framework, an overview of of, of what theoretical economists do. So, so what a theorist, so theory uh, takes these objects, it takes some objects that I've described and it match, maps them into a joint density over this outcome. That's what theory does. Okay. Okay, so what does empirical work do? Um, so what it does, um, so this is often called structural empirical work. Um, and essentially, all good empirical work strives to be structural. Um, either consciously or unconsciously. So what empirical work does is it, it has data and it has sample. So, so these theoretical objects, these are population objects. So that's what this, above this line theory, those are population objects. Um, and we use probability theory Um, 
and we use math and we use computations to figure things out. What empirical work is it uses statistics, which I did not put above the line. So what empirical work does is it starts with data. So it has sample observations and typically in a time series context, it has one realization of actually often um, it often has a sample of just a subset. I'm going to put um, I'm going to put this y twiddle where y twiddle is some subset of y t. You may not observe all the observations. You may not observe all the variables that your model determines. There could be some hidden variables. This is a common problem. Uh, confronted by empirical workers. So we, the empirical work starts with data and then the purpose of the purpose of empirical work, what is the purpose? Um, is to, to make inferences about the parameters from YT twiddle. That's the problem. And um, so the way I went to a, went to a conference with uh, physicists and chemists and astronomers, and they're in the same business. Many of them are in a business very close to ours. So what they call theory, they call the direct problem. They call this the direct problem. And what they meant by this, Um, is given theta, find the probability distribution of the data, uh, the population probability distribution, find that. And how, were, how did they often do this? Um, computation, simulation. They were using um, you know, create histograms on the computer. Um, so pick a theta, do this. That's called the direct problem, they call this. Uh, what empirical work does, what these physicists said, this is called the inverse problem. What they do, the inverse problem is given some YTs, um, use F of YT, use F of, use this thing, use this theoretical object, this piece of it, to infer theta. And this, this typically up here, we're going to generate many samples, many, generate many YT sequences given theta. Here, what we want to do is we want to use this. This is our, th our theory comes in this form. We're going to use that theory of the joint density with one sample. That's one sample, that's one time series going from say zero to T to figure out theta. And this object here is called a likelihood function when you use it this way. And there's basically uh, two approaches to using the likelihood function. One is frequentist. There we would do maximum likelihood. And we would make, um, we would make, make name and Pearson, name and Pearson inferences about theta, 
about hypothesized thetas. The other is Bayesian. And what we would do there is we would start off with a prior, our own subjective beliefs about this, and then use the data to construct posterior beliefs, pi of theta given what we observed from zero to t. So that's Bayesian methods. And here, these are very computer intensive. Here we use something called Markov chain Monte Carlo. And that will really put Python to work. And this, here we use hill climbers. These two philosophies, frequentist and Bayesian, are actually very closely related uh, computationally. Okay. Um, well, that's a general framework how I think about doing applied work and what I want to do when I do theory or someone else does theory that I want to test. I want the theory, what do I want the theory to be? I want the theory to come in the form of an economic model. It's cast in terms of preferences, technologies, and these things. I want an equilibrium concept that tells me how to put all these things together and to compute a joint density, a theoretical joint density. Um, the parameters that I talk about are gonna be things like risk aversion, uh, stochastic processes for exogenous shocks, um, parameters of production functions, um, you know, some kinds of models, parameters of preferences that tell me how much people like or dislike their children or their parents, and so on. Those are the objects that I want to, to make inferences about given the observations that I have. Okay. So we can pause here. So I've kind of told you what the key objects are. I keep using this term, parameters of underlying things, that list. A model, which is gonna be a joint density. given the parameters, and then some, a theory of inference. Okay, so. So with that said, let me give you a little of uh, tell you a little bit about why Python is just naturally uh, the attractive to this way of doing theory and the empirical work, and how it actually, so Python has a similar philosophy. Um, and this might be my projecting uh, into Python, what I, uh, what I see everywhere. But the key thing is objects, um, you know, functions, mapping our parameters into uh, outcomes, um, algorithms for solving the inverse problem, basically Python is a candy store for these things. And another thing which I'm not going to have too much time to tell you about, uh, I'm not going to have any time to tell you about now, but uh, I'm sure you'll learn about this in the boot camp. is a, um, a certain logic called, uh, has various names, it's called backward induction. It's called dynamic programming.
It's called sequential analysis. And even if you want to Google it, it's called the Viterbi algorithm. Um, these are all basically the same thing. Um, this is used with hidden Markov models. There's a very nice Python program for that, by the way. Um, the logic is, is um, to solve big problems by breaking them into a sequence of small problems. And this logic is used, this, this is used throughout game theory. It is, it is the foundation of the idea of subgame perfection. It's used throughout um, something called recursive competitive equilibria. Lucas and Prescott are founders of that. And it's used throughout estimation theory, uh, the so-called common filter. Not so-called, it's called common filter. All of those are using this backward induction logic uh, in one way or another. Okay, so why do I mention that here? So all of this is, this is, these, this is the, this logic is a way of simplifying um, all the tasks that we have to do to solve the direct problem and the inverse problem. Uh, so you'll learn about that. Now, why do I mention that now when I started talking about Python? Well, um, the, notion of a, the notion of a class, a Python class, um, Python is, is object oriented. Big part of it is object oriented. Um, I'll show you a place where you can read about this in a minute. Object oriented programming, OOP. Um, and if you think about it, um, the thing to watch for is it uses a backward induction logic all over the place. And it, it instructs you, uh, to think recursively. Another, another term for this backward, backward induction, another term for it. Uh, sometimes there's also a forward induction, they're closely related, um, is a recursive approach. So uh, I'm, I'm uh, gonna be 74 years old. I've been teaching uh, dynamic programming and recursive competitive equilibria for 30, 40, or 50 years. Um, but in the fat, last few years, some of my um, students, research assistants, have, who know Python better than I have, have showed me that I was not thinking recursively enough. And we encountered this when we, when we were uh, sitting together doing some uh, Python programming. And, um, and the, the whole logic is, solve some things first, once and for all, and use them later. Sounds really simple, uh, and in a sense it is. It's the philosophy that, that actually um, underlies object-oriented programming. Another reason I like this object-oriented programming is you'll see when I was um, honestly and uh, sincerely telling you how I think about economic models and empirical work. I may have sounded pedantic because I wanted quite quickly to define the objects in which I, I was talking about, the theoretical objects, the empirical objects, how they fit together. And, um, and because that's a way of, that's a way of, narrowing things and tightening them and making them more rigorous. Well, it turns out Python has the same philosophy. So kind of it's a, it's a match made in heaven for a modern macroeconomist to, um, to admire 
and learn from this structure of, of Python. Okay, so I was asked to you know, start this lecture by telling you why I like Python um, and um, why I spend time studying it. Um, and those are my reasons. So now I wanna uh, show you a few things. Uh, so hopefully, um, so there's, um, there's a website um, that you can Google. It's put together by John Staczerski and my, a bunch of other really good uh, friends and myself. And um, I got involved in this because I wanted to learn Python. And John Staczerski is my teacher. Okay, so if you go to this website, I'm going to show you several things about it. There's um, a couple of things I want to show you now are something called notebooks. And these are a secret weapon for learning Python, doing research, uh, brainstorming by, your, by yourself and with your friends, and um, learning how to Python program and present things. I'll show you some examples. Those are the notebooks. And then we have two sets of these lectures. Um, I'm just going to show you the Python version. There's a Julia version too. So if you um, click that, so here's the Python version. Um, and um, it's, there's a bunch of lectures. And uh, I like I recommend these um, as a way of learning things. Um, they're like how I learn things. There's a lecture on object oriented program, which you could uh, look at. Um, so it's gonna it's gonna teach you some things, and it's gonna it's gonna try to propagandize you um, and convince you that these are useful. So that's how these lectures go. Um, okay, another thing um, that we have here. Um, come back here. Um, go back home. I want to show you some of these uh, notebooks because we have a gallery of notebooks. Um, so there's something called uh, Jupyter Notebooks. And um, it's a, it, it's, Jupyter Notebooks will come with Python, with Anaconda. And they're a wonderful way of, um, of uh, doing analysis. So, so here's what some of these will, so we have a bunch of, you'll see we have a bunch of lectures uh, written by various people. Um, a whole bunch of them. Um, so, like here's one my uh, friend Chase Coleman and I wrote. There's a classic problem um, that stumped one of the smartest people of the 20th century, Milton Friedman. And it was because he didn't know dynamic programming. Why didn't he know it? Because it hadn't been invented. And his being stumped by this problem um, is intimately connected to the origin of dynamic programming and sequential analysis. So if we click on this, we get this thing called a Jupyter Notebook. And uh, you can download this. And um, I use these as a way to, to practice my Python and to, um, to learn about it. Um, Okay, so, so here's the way this goes. Um, the way these notebooks go, uh, you can learn about, about the web, is you can do two things. First, you can write beautiful uh, LaTeX code that explains what you're doing. And then in these cells that are colored, um, what those are is, that's actually Python code. Um, and you'll see a Python code will always start with import, NumPy as NP, and then import some other things. Um, so you'll be learning about this. Um, you know, a piece of advertisement, we're importing QuantEcon as QE. That's a whole suite of, of uh, programs. Okay, so then what we do is um, um, we wrote some homemade programs we call Wald Reap. Okay, so now what we do is we, uh, we do some preaching. 
Uh, so Jason, I wrote this because um, we want to uh, learn and teach about problems that Friedman um, encountered. So, so we, um, in a notebook, you can just all write this text. And then, uh, so we tell the story, which is in Milton Friedman and his wife, Rose Friedman's uh, bi autobiography. It's very charming. So we tell about that. And then, uh, see, Chase and I just made this up. Um, so then, um, so now we, we describe um, dynamic programming. Um, and we take this from a great book on, um, with, uh, on, on uh, dynamic programming. Um, so now we formulate this in the way that the person who solved this problem was. And the person who solved it was named Abraham Wald. And Mil the story is Milton Friedman couldn't solve this problem. You can read about it here. He worked on it for a week with another person who was very smart named W. Allen Wallace. They couldn't solve it. Um, at the time, Friedman said this is probably the best, most interesting problem either one of us will ever encounter. They couldn't solve it. And a week of Milton Friedman's time uh, is a lot. Uh, he couldn't solve it. So he asked somebody else, a um, young person, to solve it, an immigrant from Europe named Abraham Wald. Um, and Wald uh, didn't say much. He came back the next day and he said, I think I can solve it. And if you read the introduction to sequential analysis, this classic book, Wald credits Milton Friedman and Alice Walls, Alan Walls for telling him about this problem. Um, anyway, so, so what we do is we've, um, we use uh, dynamic programming to formulate this um, problem. And then um, we preach about it and then we tell you how we solve it and formulate it. And we do this in Python. This is very simple Python code. Um, another thing about Python that you'll learn about is it makes beautiful plots. So um, the inputs into this problem are some probability distributions. Um, so we, we describe these. We describe the losses and costs. And then now here's a secret weapon that comes out of dynamic programming, a Bellman equation. And um, this is a fundamental thing in both game theory and in general equilibrium analysis, applied general equilibrium analysis. And I'll tell you what the, the, key, the key idea about dynamic programming and development equation, it's to, um, it's actually, it starts off and seems incredible because it's kind of a bluff. You have a problem and what you assume, the first thing you assume is that the answer to the problem has a certain form. And actually the answer to the problem is a function. It's, um, it's a function of something called a state. It's, it's a, so here the state is gonna be P, which is the probability of something, and J is gonna be the value of the problem. So what this equation says, the value of the problem as a function of some probability is gonna equal a bunch of stuff on the right, um, but among the stuff on the right is the expected value of the same function next period. So this is a, this is a, uh, and, and the thing that you want to solve is the, what J is, is it's the answer to the problem. It's the value of the problem. And um, what you do is you, in dynamic programming, you, you start off by saying, let J of P be the solution, be the value of the problem. Then you do a little reasoning and you show that the value of the problem has to solve this equation. It has, it's an equation that has, doesn't look like progress because it's, it's got what you don't know on the left and it's got you what you don't know on the right. So how do you solve that? Well, you got to solve that equation. This is a, you got to, you, you're in the real realm of functional equations. It's a classic functional equation with a lot of structure and um, you got to solve it. So um, one way that you solve it is you, you put it on the computer and use iterative techniques. And there's some beautiful algorithms for solving it that are in QuantiCon. 
You probably study some of them in this class. So then we do some preaching and now um, we define some functions. What you'll see here is these are, um, these are functions. Anytime you see a def, and an imp, you're going to learn about those in Python uh, with this. The, the, key, uh, the key thing is you've got a def and you've got a return. Um, it's telltale sign of a function. We just define some functions, and then we define this thing called a Bellman operator. Um, and then we, oh, now, here we define a class. This is, this is the object-oriented programming part of this. And um, I think you'll learn about classes. Um, I'll just make a confession. I found these a little confusing at first. Not at first. Um, for a while. Because um, some of the syntax confused me. Um, that doesn't mean it's going to confuse you. But, um, you know, like this thing right here, this definite. Um, so what a, what a class is going to do is it's, um, it's going to be an object that's going to have a bunch of attributes that you can assess. Um, so it's very powerful. Um, so we used a class to, to solve this, this whole thing. Um, actually, and actually what we did in this lecture, first we used functions and then we rolled up our sleeves and, uh, and went to uh, object oriented programming. So then we do this and then, um, and then we, uh, we run it. And, um, so you can use, you can see this notebook. The great thing about these notebooks is you can download them and then you can go and change numbers and then recompute things. So that's the way these notebooks go. Um, okay. I'm going to give you another example of a notebook. Um, okay. So I'll tell you a story about this. Um, previously, I told you um, at the beginning, I told you a philosophy of doing economic, building economic models and estimating them. And it was, I talked in terms of objects, preferences, technologies, and information, maybe endowments, maybe government policies. All of those things were precise objects. Um, so my friend Lars Hansen and I um, wrote a book um, which um, called um, Recursive Models of Dynamic Linear Economies. And our idea was we were going to build a whole bunch of general equilibrium models that were all special cases of a big class. And the classes, they were linear, quadratic, dynamic. And so the key objects there were preferences. That was going to be a list of matrices. Technologies, another list of matrices. Information, another list of matrices. Equilibrium concept, competitive equilibrium. So equilibrium objects, prices and quantities. Um, so now we're going to have parameters that characterize preferences, technologies, information, perhaps government policies. Give me a list of parameters. And now we want to solve the direct problem and the inverse problem. So, um, so we described a suite of algorithms for doing that, resting heavily on dynamic programming. And the, the interesting thing is you can actually use dynamic programming um, to solve both the direct problem and the inverse problem. This might sound a little mysterious. And the reason is there's a beautiful theory of duality between dynamic programming and common filtering. Uh, even if you don't understand that, just, just, just store that. Because it turns out dynamic programming and common filtering are isomorphic to each other. They have the same mathematical structure. They use the same computer programs. So what that means is um, there's a double kick in dynamic programming in estimating dynamic models. Okay, so, so here's what this was written. This, uh, what uh, 
what a graduate student, a very good graduate student at um, NYU did last year. He he um, he learned Python over the uh, the winter break, um, and then started working as RA in the summer. So what he did was he wrote Python versions of of uh, he wrote a Python class of the of Lars Hansen and my uh, 213 book. And um, he calls it, here it is. It's called the uh, DLE class. And, um, and it turns out there's zillions of models that are special cases of this class. One of them is a famous paper by uh, Sherwin Rosen, um, Murphy and Shankman in the 1994 um, JPE. It's a, it's a beautiful paper, um, which is about cattle cycles. It's a rational expectations model of cattle cycles. And um, so, so what this little uh, notebook does, this is a Jupyter notebook um, that uh, describes the model. See, Sebastian Graves wrote this, describes the model. It maps the model into this framework by just setting a bunch of matrices equal to special values. So, so look what he's doing. Here's a technology technology for, for, for producing cattle. That has to do with, you know, Sherwin Rosen was great. He, he studied what's actually going on in technology of cattle production. Um, so that led to a, several matrices that are inputs in a Lars and my general class. So, so here he's defining those matrices. You see the delta, theta, and so on. Uh, information, so he has pre he's gonna have preferences, technology, information. Those are the objects in terms of which he's reasoning. And now he's going he's to map those into a Python object. Um, so now here he's just setting things up. He's taking a bunch of parameter values. And, so, and where is he getting those from? He's getting them from um, Rosen, Murphy, and Shankman. Uh, he's reading them from the paper. And then, um, and then, uh, and then what's he doing? Uh, there he's doing this and then okay now he's gonna he's gonna compute an equilibrium now that's gonna go by so fast um, so here's when he computes an equilibrium uh, see where it says econ 1 DLE uh, that's that's creating uh, a competitive equilibrium of the economy in which he inputs these objects information technology and preferences he's forming a DLE and then what he and, and then what DLE has various attributes. Uh, so econ one now that becomes an object, and that's an object that's in equilibrium. It's got everything you want to know about prices and quantities and various aspects of the dynamics. So look at this right here where he says dot econ dot compute steady state. Um, that's all. Once he computes this, once he calls this, that object automatically computes everything. Um, and then everything after a dot is called a method or an attribute that you can grab from the object, from the object that's created by the class. That's the way this goes. And then, um, and then, uh, what this does is, uh, you know, what now he's going to run a simulation, um, very easy to do. And then he's going to uh, simulate it. And actually, this does generate cattle cycles, big cattle cycles. Um, and uh, then he, he computes impulse response functions. Again, those are, those are um, where are they? They're, they're automatically inside the class. Econ1.irf impulse response function. So those are objects created, uh, at, attributes. So um, that's an example of what you can do. So once we put this notebook live, you can actually take this notebook and, um, and create your own economies. You could change the parameters. You could change the specification. Um, and um, um, you know, to do that productively, you have to understand and buy into the objects in terms of which the model is cast. And you might disagree with the specifications of some of those and um, create some others. And then it turns out um, 
So this was an example. This notebook only solves the direct problem, um, but it could, the machinery that's used here could be used to solve the inverse problem too, the estimation problem. So I could go on for a long time about why I like 